Father, we praise you for the opportunity to have church tonight. You're wonderful to us. We're going to try to be serving you and loving you, feeling your presence. I'm going to read a little scripture. It says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So God would, would um, commend us that we are letting our light shine and He wants us to let it shine so that when people see our good works, they will glorify God which is in heaven, our Father. And it won't be just well, boy, they're talented, or boy, that was good, or it won't be that. It'll be, oh, I felt God. Glory to God that He did that. Praise the living God. We're going to praise Him and worship Him tonight. Hallelujah.
songs? Okay. Thank you, Jesus. That is going to lead for us. Bill's going to play the bass. Don's going to play the electric guitar there. What do you call that one? This is acoustic. Electric guitar. Acoustic electric. Brother Jose's over there on the automatic drums, right? <laughs> They're not automatic. <laughs> acoustic drums. <laughs> I didn't think there was any automatic. There are some on this piano, but I can't play with them. I get all out of whack <laughs> if I put them on. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. So Netta's going to come with a good songbook, and we're going to sing a bunch of those good songs. <laughs> Sister Netta is going to sing. Well, let's sing one, and then we'll pray. I forgot about praying, but we will sing one of the choir songs and then we'll pray. Got too excited about hallelujah. <laughs> Wanted to have some more of that. Hallelujah. Bring a good one now. I need one of those books too. Some of you that repented this morning are here at this, for the service tonight. You know what? When you stay in God's house, you can keep the victory. You can. Yeah. Hallelujah. I don't have one.
Stacy and um, Ali Ann and um, Josh, Katie, and Tammy, and Mike and Mark, and um, remember um, Sister Rainey and OG Warner. Remember um, all our neighbors and Michael's brothers and sisters and my brothers and sisters. Too.
sit by this frame.
one. It wasn't a quiz. Everyone. I don't like crowds. Do you like crowds? Like lots of people? We're going to get a lot of no's here. I'm sure we get a lot of no's out there. They're, they're always a hassle. And here, I mean, Orlando and Tampa, and I don't like to go to those cities because it's just crowded. It's hard to get around. It's hard to get where you need to go. It's hard to find stuff because you you can't, like, look for it and slow down because there's guys behind you are going to run you over, right? Rumping and shoving and... Then in New York City, it's that's crowded, folks. I'm telling you. Now go to North Dakota; it's wide open up there. There are no crowds. There. I love North Dakota, South Dakota. No crowds. Wide open spaces. If I can avoid crowds, I try to do it. I mean, I. But usually, they can't be avoided. I mean, if you want to go to do something, if you want to go to an art festival, you want to. There's gonna be a lot of people there. And we just have to kind of deal with that, right? And hopefully it's not too much of a thing, but you know, you can't find a place to park and it's just, you're walking and walking and walking and bumping into people. And and some people are very nice, but some people are kind of rude. And you just never know what you're gonna get with a crowd. I mean, a crowd can be a really good crowd, a very upbeat crowd, a very helpful crowd, and then be more like a mob, right? A bunch of angry people. Um, Sister Linda, you went to one of the political rallies a few years ago, right? That was a mob. And some of them were there to be supportive, but there were others there that were not supportive, right? It was a divided crowd. Almost every crowd you're going to have is going to have a division in it. It's very hard to get a unified crowd. That's just a fact. ask you to pray for Lori right now. She's not feeling well. Her stomach is upset, Lord. Chest hurts. Lord, we ask you for your See, now that's a good crowd. Right? So that was a good crowd, right? We were all gathered together in unity to try to help somebody, right? That's the kind of crowd I like. If you look up the definition of a crowd, it's defined as a large number of people that are gathered together in a disorganized or unruly manner. Right? That's a pretty good definition of a crowd. But if we want to go and attend something that's special, a uh, uh, first Friday here in Lakeland they have in the streets, I like to go. I like to see what this, the vendors have to sell and you know the different produce and the different things. Of, you know the, the farmers markets and things like that. I like to go to the farmers market because it's early in the morning and people don't like to go early in the morning. But the first Friday, it's only once a month, and so it's, there's a bunch of people. I really don't like a bunch of people. I really don't. I, I don't feel safe. I, I feel like, here's what it is for me, because I grew up in a big city, right, near Washington, D.C., and as a kid, I was taught to always be aware of your surroundings. Well, when you're in a crowd with all those people, you are on heightened alert all the time. I almost stress myself out just watching out for everybody that's around me. And Lee will tell you, all of a sudden I'll grab something and I'll just move them off to the side because I know something bad's going to happen over here. 
you know, we're trying to be safe. And it's no different in the times of Jesus. In Jesus' time, he had fewer crowds with multitudes, they called them. There's some examples of that, and I want to highlight the impact of the crowd on the situation in the Bible that was occurring. Um, let's look first at Matthew chapter 21. daughter of Sion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass and the colt of the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put them put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude, that's a crowd, spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved. All the city, there's another crowd, was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Now this is a good crowd. Right? This, this is a rejoicing crowd. This is a, a, an example of a good crowd experience. The people were glad, so very glad, that the Messiah had come. And they created this shower of praise for Jesus as He came back to the city. And it was all, there's no benefit to the crowd. It was all for His honor and His glory that they did it. This is the kind of crowd I would not mind being a part of. Right? They were in one mind and one accord praising God and praising Jesus Christ, the Messiah. They acknowledged him, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. But not all crowds are like that. Look at Luke seven, Luke chapter seven. We do a lot of Luke. Luke talked a lot about crowds. Now these are not all the examples of crowds. There are hundreds of examples of crowds and multitudes in the Bible, specifically in the New Testament, following Jesus, following him around. <clears throat> 7-11 And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain and many of his disciples went with him and much people. There's another crowd. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city behold there was a dead man carried out the only son of his mother and she was a widow and much people a crowd of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the buyer, and they that bare him stood still and said, Young and he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God hath visited his people. And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about. So Jesus traveled to this city called Nain. Um, Nain is, let me get my geography right, south and west of of. Nazareth. Not very far. It's only like a couple of miles. It's not, not very far of a trek. <coughs> and 
Yeah, south and east of, of Nazareth. Look what it says in, in verse 11. And it came to pass the day after that he went into the city of Cobain, and many of his disciples went with him, and much people. Many of his disciples and much people. Now, the crowd wasn't there like they were at the return or the triumphal re-entry to praise Jesus. That's not what they were gathered there for. This crowd were mostly onlookers, curious people. They wanted to see something. They wanted to see some new thing, right? Some miracle. Something that they'd never experienced or seen before. They'd heard this man did, does some things like that. He'd already performed some miracles before this. They'd heard of Jesus. They wanted to see. They weren't necessarily disciples. Because it says disciples and much people. So the much people were not disciples. Right? Does that make sense? They just wanted to witness miracles. See something good. Something out of the ordinary. Bystanders. Curious bystanders would be a good word for this crowd. And Jesus was fine with them following to see what was happening. I mean, his whole reason for doing miracles was to show the power of the Father. He wanted people to see. That's why he didn't push away from the multitudes unless he had to. That's why there's so many examples of him having multitudes around him all the time. That's what he wanted. He wanted those multitudes. But this widow's son, another one that we don't know their name, talked about that this morning, he raises her son from the dead. That, that had not been done. Right? He hadn't raised Lazarus yet. That was later. This hadn't been done before. And that sort of changed things for the crowd. Now, you think the crowd was impressed with that? Well, yeah. That would never been done before. I saw a new thing. That is a new thing. In verse 16, it says, And there came a fear on all and they glorify God saying that a great prophet is risen up among us and that God have visited his people in verse 17 and this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about so what happened in that little town of Nain southeast of Nazareth didn't stay there they saw it. And they went out and told a bunch of people about it. Because it was miraculous. It was impressive. It was something they'd never witnessed before. Never. That never happened before. Then he just said, Arise. I say it to thee, Arise. That's all he did. And the word spread throughout Judea, through the whole region round about. Now, Judea, if you're not familiar with first century geography, a very large region. <laughs> Judea spread from the northern part of Galilee up through, almost through Syria, up into Phoenicia. Yeah? yeah. Judea? Yeah. Oh, it was south? Yes. Well, now i got to look at my geography. <laughs> It was a big area. I do know that. It was a big area. So these people in this crowd started out as sort of passive passive observers, but Jesus converts them into active believers. What are they doing? They're going around the regions of Judea and all the regions round about telling them what Jesus can do with the power of the Father. And there was a bunch of them because they went and spread it all through the whole regions. 
Turn back a few pages to Luke chapter 5. Uh, Luke 5 and 17. And it came to pass on a certain day that he was teaching, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee, Galilee, can't speak this evening, and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men brought a man in a bed, a man which was taken with a palsy, and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. In other words, to lay the man before Jesus. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude or the crowd, they went up on the housetop and led him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And when they, he saw their faith, he saw their faith, this is the four men, he, Jesus, said unto him, the man, man, thy sins are forgiven thee. I'll stop there for a minute. This is the story about Jesus healing the, Jesus healing the paraplytic man. And the first thing I want to do is sort of list all the people and the participants in this little story. Because there's a number of groups in this crowd. You have Jesus, His disciples. That's one crowd. Then you've got His friends, the man, and his three, four friends who carried him on the bed. But then you also have the Pharisees and what they call in the Bible the doctors of the law. The doctors of the law are the Sadducees. So they were the ones that really um, created. They were the lawyers. They were the people that knew the law, that published the law. And, they, and notice where they're from. Not just from this town, but from all parts of Galilee, Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And more crowds also. A lot of people. A lot of different groups. But let's talk about that part of the crowd that was part of the religious leadership for just a minute. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the lawyers. that the laws of Moses were written and preserved and interpreted by these men. That was their role in Jewish culture. They were there to protect the law, to make sure that the law was obeyed. Right? But they weren't just protecting the laws of Moses because the things that they were doing at this time were way beyond what was ever written down by Moses. Right? They, they took, and if you look at from, from the time of the prophet Malachi until Jesus, it's about 400, just over 400 years. They twisted and contorted and over-examined and took the original laws that were there. Just, we'll take one. On the Sabbath. They said, you shall not work on the Sabbath. So the people started saying, well, what, what constitutes work? I mean, can I go get water for my house? Can I feed my cows? Can I... They would want this. So they went and made... It was 39 categories of work. And then there were hundreds of tasks under each of those categories that defined work that you couldn't do on the Sabbath. Thousands. And that's just one thing. <laughs> one law. And they blew it up into thousands of rules and regulations. They, they made it so hard for people to understand that the, the whole they made the whole ability to keep the law completely an impossibility for someone because it was just too much. It was just too much that I could just do something wrong with because they made too many rules. They, they took they made it unreachable, an unreachable goal to be able to go and do. This is what Jesus was battling with these men. 
the Sadducees and the Pharisees. That's why he was targeting them. Because he had taken his father's truths and twisted them. And they didn't twist them for God's benefit. They twisted them for their own power. Because they were the ones that understood and made the laws and protected the laws and enforced the laws. And that gave them power with man. And that wasn't what the law was about. Giving them power. That's not what the law was created for. To give them power. Right? So they were misusing the law for their own gain and benefit. Right? They had all the best things. They had all the power. They could put people to death. I mean, they were the most powerful crowd of that era. The Pharisees and the Sadducees. <coughs> but let's look at the others. The ones that they were trying to catch. That's what they were really there for, by the way. Why else would this, the Pharisees and the Sadducees go all the way out into the, the, the backwoods of Nazareth and Galilee? Why would they be hanging out with Jesus? They certainly weren't there to support him. They were trying to find ways to condemn him. To find him doing something wrong. We talked this morning about healing on the Sabbath. You know, why? You know, it seems like every time they caught him healing on the Sabbath, which was work to them. And then Jesus said, well, wait a minute. Which one of you that loses a sheep on the Sabbath won't go out and find it? Leave the others and go and find him and bring him home hypocrites. Right? You say you can't do work, but yet you don't work. They had distorted his father's intent to make themselves more powerful. And they were sitting there in that house trying to catch him saying something or catch Jesus doing something that they could condemn him for. They were not a good crowd. They were not a good crowd. Let's talk about the man's friends. Now, the man's friends were just incredible human beings. I mean, first of all, if you've ever tried to carry something like that, it's not simple, right? You've got to move together because you can trip, you can, you know, carrying a stretcher like that is... Very, and we don't know how big this man was, right? We don't know how heavy he was, or but then to carry him up to the roof. I mean, you know, this takes an effort. The tiling and all that. I mean, I've heard different sermons preached about what the roof was constructed of and how they had to dig it out with their hands or whatever. I mean, still, just a lot of effort, right? I would have sit him out in the front, just holler inside, hey, Jesus, come out here, or something, right? But they knew that if they got their friend to Jesus, that he could heal them. Right? Right. He did. Um, I'm sorry, I lost my place. The wind blew my Bible. Hold on. No, that's right. And they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude. They went up on the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. Their zeal to find help for their friend was amazing. They were trying to do anything they could to help him. But the challenge that they faced was that the crowd, they couldn't find a way that they might bring him because of the multitude. The crowd was preventing them. They were not being helpful. They were in the way. They were blocking access from the man to get to Jesus. Right? Sometimes the crowds 
balk us from getting to Jesus. We have to find a way. We have to have the zeal that these four friends had to push through that, to find a way to get to Jesus for what we need. Through the crowd, around the crowd, over the crowd, whatever you, you can do, that's what it takes. It takes effort. And these men, these men made that effort on behalf of their friend. We can't allow anything to get between ourselves and Jesus Christ. Nothing. This crowd was hindering. They were not helping. They were obstructive, not constructive. But the friends had faith. And Jesus recognizes their faith. And because of their faith, not because the man did anything, right? Jesus saves and heals the man. Because of the faith of the four friends. Wouldn't you like to be one of those four? There's a song that Bill and I like that talks about that. But Jesus recognizes their faith and the man is healed. <coughs> Turn to Matthew 8 and 1. Crowds followed Jesus all over the place. Matthew 8 and 1. When He was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed Him. Now, it's not clear whether the crowd was on the mountain with Him I think they were, because that was right after the Sermon on the Mount, right? So, I mean, they, a bunch of them were with him, and then more probably followed when he got down into the the bottom of the mountain or the area. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, "Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean." And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, "I will be thou clean." And immediately. His leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus saith unto him, See thou, tell no man, but go thy way and show thyself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Who's them? The crowd? The priests? He heals the man. It says in verse 3, And immediately, his leprosy was cleansed. Those, those people, that multitudes that came down from the mountain that would follow him, that followed him, saw the whole thing. Right? Because it says, and behold, that means like right then, right? Whoop, right, right away. <laughs> behold. There's no gap in time there. There were these witnesses. Now he tells the man not to tell anybody else. Didn't tell the whole crowd not to tell everybody else, did he? I mean, they didn't have any specific instructions not to say anything. So I would think, it's not documented, but I would think that that crowd probably went around and told some people. I mean... At this point in Matthew, I don't think another leper had been cleansed. Had name in the Syria been cleansed yet? I think that's a little later. No? That's Old Testament. No. That was a long time ago. Matthew 19. Just a couple more. <clears throat> These are two kind of And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came to the coasts of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. And the Pharisees, here they come again, also came unto him, tempting him, 
and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And then he goes through multitudes followed him and he healed them there. And as soon as he heals them, here come the Pharisees trying to trip him up. That's what they wanted. Now, if you read, he departed from Galilee, and then these Pharisees are following along. They're not following because they're Jesus' supporters, remember. They're his enemies. They're trying to trip him up, trying to finish him, because what he is teaching is against what they are doing. And that means that's a threat to their power, their power structure. They're never that far away from him. You read most of the stories about Jesus, and there's usually Pharisees hanging around, or doctors of the law, Jewish leaders. They were keeping an eye on him. And it, and he's moving out in the country. I mean, this is the, you know, Judea by Jordan. This is not in the city kind of area, right? I mean, they're following him out into the wilderness. They're tracking him down. They're looking for him to make a mistake somewhere, anywhere that he's going. Luke chapter 8. Luke 8 and 40. And it came to pass that when Jesus returned, the people gladly received him, for they were all waiting for him. So here's an anticipating crowd. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house, for he had only one daughter, about twelve years of age, and she lay a dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. Throng, that means crowded. Right? They pressed into where they were making it hard for him to get there. This this man's Jairus' daughter lay a dying. It means she was sick unto death. But as he went, the people thronged him. I'm assuming that's Jairus and that's Jesus and that's just everybody trying to get to Jairus' house and the people are so many people. And again, if you've ever been to a big city like New York or Los Angeles, or, you know, they're all packed together and you can't, it's busy time, you can't get around. You can't go, you can't just walk where you want to walk. I mean, you kind of have to move with the flow of the crowd. Look down at, um, where did I see that? Hold on. Page, but that's why I can't find it. We're going to talk about this other part of the woman, but I want you to go. It's in the notes. It's all right. The crowd was keeping Jairus from getting his job accomplished. The crowd was also keeping Jesus from getting his job accomplished. Right? They were thronging them. They were making it hard for him to do. But then there's another person that's trying to get a need fulfilled by Jesus. Look at verse 43. And a woman, having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any. The same crowd that was preventing Jesus and Jairus were preventing and obstructing this woman. She had to press through that crowd to even just touch the hem of his garment. But she did press through. It was her passion to get healed. And she had faith. She touches his garment and Jesus said that Jesus had the virtue had flowed out of him. Someone has touched me. Truly touched me. Verse 48. He stands. 
And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. Thy faith that made thee whole. Go in peace. It was her faith that overcame the crowd. It was her faith that caused her to want to press through that crowd to touch the hem of his garment. It was his faith. No, it was his faith that the leper had that healed him. Remember? The four friends. What happened? Because of their faith. They forgave the sins of the man. They healed him. And now, Jairus is told that all he has to do is believe. Verse 50, But when Jesus heard it, the men's uh, master's house came and told him the daughter is dead. Jesus heard it. He answered him saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. Believe only. Have faith. I want to point out that these people got something that they desperately needed because they had faith. They didn't let the crowd get in their way or oppress them because they had faith. Who? They had faith in the Lamb of God. Not in their own doings. The Pharisees didn't get any help from Jesus. Why? Because they didn't have any faith in Jesus. The bulk of the crowd got no help because they were just onlookers. They were just observers. They were just bystanders. They had a little bit of faith, maybe. Or a small percentage of that crowd maybe had faith. So the way we get through the crowd is by our faith. Let's look at one more. This crowd is not a very good crowd. I'm just going to preempt that. They had an active role that did really great things for all of us. They really did. Although they had no clue about what they were doing at the time. Not a clue. They were just sort of following the leader. Oh, well, you know, if you say this is what we should do, well, okay, yeah, we'll do that, right? They were voicing their approval, but only for the person that they thought was in charge or right or was going to win the, the, the opinion. Right? They weren't looking for right and wrong, right? They were looking for who's the best public opinion, and I'm going to grab a hold of that. They'll wave that flag. They didn't know what they were doing. They were just following the leader as they interpreted who was in charge of their crowd. Look at Luke 23. I think you know the crowd I'm talking about. <coughs> Starting at verse 18. And they cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man, and release unto us Barabbas. Who for a certain sedition made in the city, was, and for murder, was cast into prison. Pilate, therefore, willing to release Jesus, spake again unto them. But they cried, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And he said unto them the third time, Why, what evil hath he done? I have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. 
and they were instant with loud voices requiring that he might be crucified and the voices of them and of the chief priests there's those guys again prevailed and Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required verse 27 and there followed him a great company of people and of women which also bewailed and lamented him Those were the daughters of Jerusalem. So two groups in this crowd. The first one was the larger group consenting to his death. Not because Pilate or any of them really even believed that he did anything wrong, but these chief priests prevailed. That was the focus of the consensus of public opinion that looked like, oh, I should be on that side. Yeah, crucify him, crucify him. Which was what needed to happen for us to be saved. So that was a good thing. But they didn't know what they were doing. It was an unruly, disorganized crowd. But they were rallying around the wrong motive. Nothing had been proven. It was only conceived that that was needed to be done. the voice of the chief priests prevailed. They were just parroting what the Jewish leadership was telling them to say as a group. Sometimes you can get people in a crowd and they will yell certain things that sound like a great message. And if you don't really think about it very long, you just start chanting with them. They were just saying what the Jewish leaders wanted them to say as a group, as a volume to voice to Pilate. And Pilate wasn't going to do anything. Pilate was going to let him go. I'll chastise him. I'll beat him a little bit. I'll let him go. No, no, no. Not good enough. Jewish leader said, no, no, no. Crucify him. Crucify him. And Pilate, at the end, gave sentence. that it should be as they required. He was trying to stand up for the right. But he also had to keep the peace with the leadership. That was his difficulty in his role. He wasn't a very strong leader. (coughs) The other part of this crowd is in verse 27. These daughters of Jerusalem were lamenting, wailing, and weeping. They might have directly been part of those other crowds that we talked about earlier that saw some of these miracles happen with the leper, with the woman, with Jairus' daughter, with the paralyzed man. They might have just heard of the things, right? It was published throughout all Judea and the regions round about about the good works that Jesus did. The things that he talked They were maybe getting some understanding of what he was saying and wanting to follow him, be his disciples. They didn't want him to die. They were just, they weren't blinded by this public opinion. They they were seeing it for what it really was. And they were sad that it was being done this way. So a lot of different attitudes in this crowd. Shouts of praise, proclaiming good works, lamenting and weeping. We've talked about these crowds, these different examples. A lot of different attitudes. From from praising his re-entry into Jerusalem to crucify him, crucify him. Quite a divergence. To the question I have for us tonight is what crowd do you want to be in? What crowd do you want to be in? The one that's just wandering along and observing? Do you want to be in the crowd that's active? Or do you want to be in the crowd that's passive and just kind of sitting around on looking? Have your own voice. Don't just parrot out what the popular opinion is with the crowd. 
So you're part of the in crowd. You ever hear that term? Be constructive, not obstructive. We need to bring people to Jesus, not block people's access to Him. We need to understand the right and we need to be intolerant of the wrongs that go on in our nation. We mentioned that crowds can separate us from having access to Jesus. Don't let that happen. Don't let them block you. Be like those four friends. Figure out a way around it. Have faith. Because you want faith moves crowds. Faith neutralizes that. You get a breakthrough by your faith. Mark 11 and 22, Jesus said, have faith in God. Jesus said that. We should do it. We should have it. Because it lets us avoid the crowd that may inhibit us from getting all the things that God has in store for us. So I don't like crowds. Sometimes I have to be in a crowd, deal with a crowd. Sometimes our life gets crowded not with people, but with things. Sometimes that's preventing us from getting to Jesus. But I just want to close with if, if you don't have the faith that you need to break through that crowd, you need to ask Jesus to give that to you. Plant that into your heart and your mind. Lord, give me the zeal that those four friends have. Give me the faith Jairus' daughter was healed. Jesus said, only believe and she will be healed. So if she's healed, what happened? He believed. He had faith. The woman believed that if she pressed through and just touched the hem of his garment, just the, the, the leg, the bottom of his robe, just brushed the material, that she could be healed. She had faith that that was going to happen. And because of her faith, she was made whole. We can be whole with God if we have that faith. We just have to keep it, grab it, use it. Don't give it up to the crowd. Amen. Oh.
in our mind and the crowd is all the people that never get the prayer answered well God don't do things like that anymore because he didn't do it for them he didn't do it for her he didn't do it for God don't save your family anymore because see all these families that are not saved but I can't say that because God has saved my family somehow I press through the crowd Somehow I got through. Somehow I am one of the ones that got through. And I want you to realize that's what you you got to do. You got to say you may never have saved their their children or theirs or theirs or theirs, but I believe you're going to save mine. I believe you're going to save my grand youngins. I believe you're going to heal my family. I believe you're going to. You feel that? You're going to see us through. I believe you're going to do it. We're not just part of the crowd of bystanders. Zacchaeus wasn't just part of the crowd. He climbed up in the sycamore tree and the Lord wanted to go to his house because he wasn't just part of the crowd. I'm not just part of the crowd. <coughs> my family, I want my family to go in the rapture. All right, Sister Barbara, me too. I want them to go in the rapture. I'm pressing through. Lord, I want my grandson in the rapture. I want my granddaughters and my grandbabies. I want all of them to be able to go when the Lord comes. And I'm pressing through. Others, they may be content. Say, there ain't nothing I can do but pray. That's what people say. There ain't nothing I can do but pray. Because they're used to no. Nobody's family saved. Oh, everybody's grand youngins are lost. No, they are not. They're not. They can't be. They must not be. They must not stay lost if they are lost. I must touch Jesus. I must take it up that thing that they carried up those stairs and I must tear the roof off 
I must find my help. I must find it. Because that's all that's going to be satisfying to me. You know how dear your children are. How dear your grandchildren are. How much they mean to you. Press through. Press through that crowd that are satisfied. Because they don't feel like they can have any better. They can. You can. Hallelujah. Get in your prayer closet and press through. Because it's not a real crowd. It's just what everybody else is and that they're doing. What everybody else is doing doesn't matter. You know, everybody else is giving up on holiness. Uh-uh. i got to go into rapture. I'm holding on. Not giving up. Looking for God to help us. Okay? I think that was a good message, brother. We needed it. We're going to press through the crowd, right, Brother Jose? And no matter what, your brothers, your mama, your daddies, they need to go, they need to go in the rapture, don't they? No matter what. It's got to happen. I've got to find the Lord. I've got to get a hold of the Lord for them. I don't know what He's going to do or how He's going to do it, but if when I get a hold of Him, He's going to do something. Right? Amen. It's our faith. It's our faith. Okay, let's all stand. We don't have any babies in here to say love each other. <laughs> but we're going to pray. We're going to ask the Lord. Give us that kind of determination, that kind of faith. Father, give it to us. That kind of determination, that kind of faith, to press through the crowd that are satisfied with the way it is and to press through the crowd to find what You've got for us that we absolutely must have, like our children being saved, our grandchildren being saved, all of our family being ready in the rapture, for the rapture. We've got to have it, Lord. Give us the determination. and Give us the power, hallelujah, to be, not be part of that crowd or be hindered by that crowd. Let us go on through to victory. We thank You and praise You. Go with us tonight now and help us through this week. Give us, Lord, a desire to seek God. We thank You for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, babies. I just saw y'all come back in. They took Gloria over there to lie down. Love each other. Love each other. Love each other. Okay. We'll see y'all Wednesday night. God bless you.